may be seated. Uh, this morning we're continuing a series that we begun about two months ago, good on uh, two months ago on spiritual gifts that we see in the Bible. This is a nine uh, nine lesson series. There are many more than nine gifts in the Bible, but we're focusing on nine of those. I would encourage you to go on our website at uh, www.resurrectionsurfside.com. We do have a place that you can take uh, a spiritual gift survey. It's about 105 questions. takes about 20 minutes to do. And uh, it's very enlightening. It's, it's fun to take as well because you start to see, uh, you, you start to see, that, well, oh, I didn't realize that I guess I might have that gift. And it, it helps to, uh, as a little bit of a compass for you to see what the Lord might uh, be doing in your heart. This morning, we're going to focus on the gift of mercy. And if you have your Bibles with you, if you could please turn to two places. Uh, the, we'll look at one, we'll look at uh, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, which is, uh, if you have your pew Bibles, it's on page 976. And we're also going to be looking at Matthew, our gospel reading, Matthew chapter 18. So that's Ephesians 2 and Matthew chapter 18. And as you're turning there, uh, I'll say a couple things about both of these verses. In Matthew, we have a story of uh, a response to a question from one of Christ's disciples, Peter, where he asked God how much he should forgive someone. And then the Lord uh, goes through, and the, the basis of the story, uh, the basis of the parable is that the Lord is saying to his disciples, you need to forgive way, way more than you think. And there's a reason for that, because I have forgiven you way, way more than you, uh, than you realize, or I'm going to be forgiving you way, way more than you realize. And our second passage in Ephesians, the basis of that is that where the apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and in the letter he explains the depth of God's mercy to us. And that we receive this by grace through faith in Him. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. But before we continue, let me pray for us one more time. Almighty God, who pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication, deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of hearts, from wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and with kindled hearts, with kindled affections, we might worship you in spirit and truth this morning. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Uh, before I moved down here to Pittsburgh, before our family moved down here to Pittsburgh, I was a chaplain in the VA, the Veterans Administration, up in Pittsburgh. And my first year, my first tour, I served uh, with hospice ministry and in my second tour, I served with uh, homeless veterans and, and addicts. And I served in a place called Shepherd's Heart. And this is a picture of Shepherd's Heart. This is uh, Mike Worshmit, um, who's praying over uh, one of the gentlemen who would come to, uh, come to Shepherd's Heart. And Shepherd's Heart is where I really learned about mercy. Now, when I left seminary, I had a great theology of mercy. Boy, I could... I can tell you about mercy up and down and left and right. But when I was with Mike, that's when, when the rubber hit the road. That's when I learned really what mercy was. And, and Mike, uh, he showed mercy in ways that I could never imagine. Uh, the way that he loved folks, the way that he prayed with folks, the way that he endured years and years and years and years with addicts. There were folks who worked there who Mike had loved on for four or five years or more through their addiction, through their homelessness, who now work, work at Shepherd's Heart. And he just loved them and showed compassion to them in ways that, to tell you the truth, I probably wouldn't have lasted that long. So Mike has, at Shepherd's Heart has been doing this for about 25 years. But one thing that, uh, the reason Mike showed such great mercy to folks is that in Mike's younger days when he was married, he just had a, his first child, a, a newborn baby, is Mike was homeless. And he had a business that, uh, that exploded and, uh, in a negative way, and it put he and his family without a home. And so that's where that first started uh, uh, to uh, stir up in his heart. And then he and his wife, Tina, moved to Pittsburgh, and both of them kind of looked at each other at the same time as they were driving around 
the streets of Pittsburgh and felt that the Holy Spirit was, was impressing on their hearts that they might start a homeless ministry. And the Lord has been working uh, with him in that for years. And so that is really where I learned about mercy, that there is, we can have all the theology in the world, we can know about mercy, we can see something on, on television and, and shake our heads, we can hear about something in the news, but the Lord is calling us to more. He's calling us to be the hands and the feet of the hands and the feet of Christ. So this morning we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the gift of mercy. We're going to look at the dark side of mercy. And we're also going to look at how God, how does God want us to understand mercy? So first, the gift of mercy. And in the Greek, the word for spiritual gift or for, for this spiritual gift of mercy is elio. And it means to be patient and compassionate towards those who are suffering or afflicted. So to be patient and compassionate toward those who are suffering uh, with affliction. So that brings up, how, what do you do with that? What do you do when you see someone suffering? Do you say, well, they should have got their act together. I'm glad that's not like me. Or do you say, boy, the Lord has shown mercy to me. How am I going to show mercy to this person? It's uh, The gift of mercy is a concern for physical as well as spiritual need of those who are hurting. Those with this gift have great empathy for, for others in their trials and their sufferings. They're able to come alongside people over extended periods of time and see them through their healing process. You know, kind of like these guys I worked with at Shepherd's Heart. These guys who had walked, who Mike had walked through and his team had walked through in their addiction and in their homelessness for years and years and years and years. You know, they had a service at, on uh, Sunday nights is when their service was. Because you, you don't have services early in the morning for homeless and for addicts. And so they would have their service at, at 5 o'clock at night. And it was a come-as-you-are service. You know, there were people who showed up high, people who showed up drunk, people who showed up homeless, and they would get loved on, they would have a service, and then afterwards, they would have a meal. A lot of folks came because of the meal. <laughs> you know, they would, they would have worship, they would hear the Word of God, and then they would get fed before sleeping in Pittsburgh for another, another cold winter. So it's walking along others. Through this, the hands and feet of God with the afflicted. The Holy Spirit gives the spiritual gift of mercy to some in the church who love and assist those who are suffering and walk with them until the Lord allows their burden to be lifted. The gift of mercy is founded in God's mercy toward us as sinners and is consistently expressed with measurable compassion. So we start to really, you really see the compassion that the Lord shows to you, and then you love out of that. You know, the story that we're going to look at in our, in our gospel reading of the servant, the unmerciful servant, the one who was shown mercy to, but yet did not show mercy to someone else, that mercy does not come out of us. It does not come out of us just saying, I'm going to show mercy. It comes out of a reliance and a dependent on Christ. Showing mercy to others is the Lord doing something in you towards others. It's completely, you know, we've talked many times about, you know, the, the bars at the, uh, you know, on the playground. You have one bar that says self and then one bar that says Christ. It's when you are, you are, you are hanging completely all of your weight is on Christ saying, Lord, I, I, I can't show mercy, but you can show mercy through me. And it's a lot relying 100% on who Christ is. Those with this gift are able to weep with those who weep and bear one another's burdens. They are sensitive to the feelings and circumstances of others and can quickly discern when someone is not doing well. They are typically good listeners and feel the need to simply be there for others. I mean, in the midst of suffering... One of our temptations is to want to fix someone instead of simply being there for them. 
as God calls us to be. And all that was found on spiritualgifttest.com. There's a dark side of mercy, too. That would be the light side. The 745 didn't get that as much. <laughs> There's also a dark side of mercy, uh, being overly compassionate. That means where uh, you're not being compassionate for the sake of others, but for the sake of you. Uh, you enable others. You, you're not loving, you're enabling. You, you can't help but to show mercy, and it's not out of not out of the mercy that Christ has shown to you, but it's out of, out of maybe your guilt. It becomes a codependent relationship when you show mercy, where you rely, where it, that's what feeds you instead of Christ. You, you showing mercy to others is the thing that feeds you instead of Christ. You uh, no boundaries in that. You overcommit. When we were in North Carolina, we were at a, at a church plant and we had a building, and the pastor one day said, who can, who can uh, lead this charge to remodel this, this room that we're worshiping in? And I, I, mean, you know, I immediately, I'll do it. And Mercedes looked at me and said, how are you going to do that? You have no time to do that. And so, you know, you, you, you're quick to volunteer in ways that are for yourself. Please keep volunteering here. <laughs> That's not what we're saying. But just think about the reasons behind it. What, what's the depth of, of why you volunteer? You can't say no to things. It's out of a guilt, a sense of guilt instead of mercy. And all of those, if you're doing it out of all of that, then when someone who you're showing mercy to disappoints you, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be bitter. And you're going to be angry. Because you're doing it so that you get fed in your heart. Christ does that. Christ is the one that feeds you. He, he may use that to bless you, and that is good, but that's when you find out the reasons that you do it. So what do you do in, the, in that case? Well, you ask the Holy Spirit to help you repent. You turn away from your sin, tor turn towards Jesus, and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and to mature you. So how does God want us to understand mercy? And we see that in our readings this morning. We see it in our New, uh, our New Testament passage. If you can look at verse 21 this morning, 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now when Jesus is saying this, he's not saying you know, when you forgive someone, you don't, you don't get your little uh, journal out and say, well, that's 76. They've got one more to go and no more forgiveness. That's all they're getting. No, but what Christ is saying, he's saying it's unlimited. You continually show forgiveness time and time again. It doesn't mean that you enable them. It doesn't mean that you don't set boundaries. It doesn't mean that you have to be their best friend. It doesn't mean that you have to be foolish, but it does mean, as Christ calls us to, to offer forgiveness, to offer forgiveness to them. Shown mercy, but refuses to show mercy is what's going on in this passage. And you've got a servant who, uh, who has this great debt, and he asks, he says, please forgive me. I'll pay this back. Well, he doesn't even get that. His boss says, look, I'll forgive the debt. And he's got the whole debt forgiven. And then what does he do? Someone, someone with a lesser debt owes him money. And he says, you're, you're going to jail. I'm not going to forgive you. I mean, this is where the, where the scary non-reliance part. You see what's happening in that? Is that he's not, he's not relying on Christ. He's relying on himself for mercy. See, when we see the depth of what Christ has done for us, then that's when we start to understand mercy. I mean, if you look at verse 32 here uh, in chapter 18, it says this, then his master summoned him, and this is after he, uh, he heard that this guy had not for forgiven a debt. Then his, then his master summoned him and said to him, 
You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And you should not, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It's a very thought-provoking passage. You see, the Lord calls us to forgive others out of what he has done for us first. I mean, are, are, are there folks out there who you have a hard time forgiving? I know there is for me. Are you holding on to something that you can't let go of? That the Lord is saying to you, you need to offer forgiveness. Look, what, look at the way I have forgiven you. The depth of love I have showed you. Owed, you owed me the bigger gift, the bigger debt. And you're not going to forgive this person with the smaller debt. I mean, that's us. But the Lord is calling us to offer forgiveness because of the mercy he has shown to us. So what is that mercy? If you'll turn over to our New Testament passage in Ephesians, we see what that mercy is. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. I mean, that's when he's talking about the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, that's the devil. He's talking about that's, you know, when you're once living uh, in the way of the world, you're under authority of, if you're not under authority of God, you're under the authority of Satan. And it's an it's a either or, it's an either or deal. But then we have this beautiful conjunction but God. Friends, this is the gospel. This is where the gospel happens. It's when he says, but God. When there is, when, when we deserve wrath, and then the Lord says, but God. Being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you have been saved. Now, when it says it's by grace you have been saved, it means that you've done nothing to earn it. It's completely the Lord who has shown mercy to you. It is grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages... So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. See, it's through faith. It's not, you, did, you didn't earn this by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You didn't earn this mercy. It was just by believing in Christ and what he's done on the cross. I mean, that's the simplicity of it. Is that when you believe... God shows his grace and mercy on you. You didn't pay back the big debt. We have nothing to boast about but Christ Jesus himself. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his, oh, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When, uh, when I first uh, began applying here or uh, sending in my resume to uh, when the position for assistant pastor was made known to me, I sent in my resume and I also sent in a sermon tape. And in that sermon tape, I gave an example uh, that I'm gonna give you now. It's one of the best pictures of mercy. And... I don't know if any of you have ever watched this show on PBS called Downton Abbey. Anyway, I cast a few, a few nods. Folks have watched it. It's addictive. Don't watch it. No, it's a good, it's a good film. 
Uh, it's a good show. Um, and we, were, we watched the whole series, and it was great. And, and we're sitting there, and there's this, at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the series, one of, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a show about this really rich family in the late 1800s in England. And, you know, they, they kind of own this huge house, and they have maids and butlers and all of this stuff. Well, the oldest daughter, you know, this pristine girl, at the beginning of the series, she has an affair and with this nobleman. And throughout the whole series, she's carrying this burden of this affair that she had with, uh, with this man. And she finally meets another guy who wants to marry her. He's this newspaper mogul. So she's got this burden, and he finds out about it. And she doesn't really want to marry him. But he says, if you don't marry me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose this, and your family will be ruined. And so one day she and her father are, are, are sitting down. She's with her dad, and she is terrified because she doesn't want to rule her, ruin her family. And her dad doesn't know about this. And so she just starts weeping. And, and the dad looks at her and he says, what's wrong? She says, Dad. And she tells him this story about this affair and how this newspaper mogul is going to ruin their family because of this. So all the weight, all the burden of her life and of her family's life is, rests on her. And her father, he looks at her and he says, you let the weight of this sin fall on me. I will take the hit for this family. You are free. Do not marry this man. I will take the burden for this family. And you're sitting there watching, you're like, this is the gospel. This is Christ. That he says to you and he says to me, I will take the burden of all your shame. I will carry the weight of all your shame. You do not have to bear it anymore. All of your hurt, all of your wounds, I will carry that burden. Oh, friends, that's enough to make you smile a little bit, isn't it? That's enough to make you have a little bit of joy. Is that enough to make you love someone? to show some compassion to someone else because of the compassion that Christ has shown to you. Friends, there are some here who have the gift of mercy, who like this is like your thing. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit and let him guide you, where you what to do with that and to where you should show compassion to others. But all of us are called to have mercy on others, and we do it out of what God has done for us first. Friends, Jesus loves you. Now go love somebody else. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know where our hearts are, and, and I, I would imagine if there's not anyone in here who doesn't have a, uh, a burden of bitterness towards, towards someone. Uh, so, Lord, would you, as a whole, would you forgive us, even as we... <laughs> Thank you for confession in this liturgy, Lord, that we can ask for forgiveness. And Lord, would you help us to love others as you call us to love. Those who have the gift of mercy, would you, would you grow it, Lord, into fruition that your kingdom might advance. In Christ's name we pray, amen.